This is interesting. Listen in. Why is that sponsored? <laughs> Why should we listen to you about fish, Ty? Because I've spent hundreds and hundreds of hours underwater observing freshwater fish in habitats, often in planted habitats. And the right level of kindness into that thing that you're looking after. And that kindness is then, because it's self-care. It. Self We're off to the fish shop. Which one are we going to? We're going to Menhead Aquatics at Huntingdon. It's only two miles away. Mm. We could do a time lapse. No, because then people could trace my address back to my home and rob me. Mm. They might nick all of my Waze equipment. This is the local river, and then you can just see some fish just by the margins there, and some aquatic plants. Looks like giant val. I'm out for my morning run at uh, 7 a.m. And just off to meet Emma and the dogs. Gonna be a fun day. Gonna choose some new fish with Ty. I'm Ty. And today's vlog is about choosing fish for my Awaze Highline 400. I've got the best guy in England that I know to help me choose the fish. In fact, the best guy in the world. Well. You're writing a book on choosing fish. Basically. I am, I am the Aquatic Habitat book. Quick plug, yeah. not even 10 seconds in. We're choosing fish today for your big planted display. Yeah. And we have to think about what's going to look nice with the plants, what's good to sort of long term sustainability for the fish, how many we're we going to put in there, mm. how they're going to grow and evolve, how they're going to interact with the space that they're in. Mm. We wanted to get something colourful, but that's not going to detract from the colourful plants, okay. and nothing that's going to get sort of lost. Mm. I mean, we think about a couple of different species and shapes because it's sort of long but also quite a deep tail. Mm. So we thought maybe some deeper bodied fish, maybe something long and slender, mm. something that kind of hangs about more slowly in the middle of the column, and then yeah. something else that's much more active. So you, you had some ideas as well. Yeah, I did. And But I love the way you're talking about um, choosing the fish, not just in terms of body shapes and mass aesthetic of the aquascape and the aquarium, but the swimming behaviours is something that we don't often consider in aquascapes so um, in my mind like uh, Remino's Tetra yeah. is really good for like because it's got a slender body yeah. and I guess it tends to swim up and down the aquarium in more kind of in a tighter school. A, a good group of them looks really effective mm. and because they've got the bright red on the face but then the rest of the body is quite pale mm. they're, they're attractive and colourful without being too brash mm. so it doesn't distract from your planting. Mm. Um, I think the other species that I maybe mentioned to you was the white fin Ventosa mm. Tetra as a deeper body Tetra they're in. We've got some in the Graham Garden. Yeah, we, we'll I, them, I yeah. got them for the display there. We'll show them. Um, just because I think some of the, the pinks and the red tones will combine nicely with your plants. Mm. Um, also, they sort of lower to mid-level kind of hang about together in a small group. You've got some lemon tetras in there mm, already. I have already, yeah. Uh, we were gonna, I was going to show you the Bolivian orange lemon tetras today, which don't actually come from Bolivia, but... This is a trade name. And are, yeah. are they a colour, colour morph? So, this is interesting. Um, the... This is interesting, listen in. The <laughs> orange morph of the lemon tetra is considered to be uh, the wild colour, really, in the Tapajos Basin. Um, but the yellow morph yes. has also been collected from the Tapajos, Tapajos Basin. So the yellow is sometimes seen as, you know, the artificial, but there are wild examples. Mm. So it's probably just geographic uh, anomalies. difference, anomalies between groups, you know. Fish don't aren't static; they do move yeah. from one place to another, and they're not going to fight each other, are they? No, they'll, they'll be quite happy. And the, the the Bolivian orange, lovely. They've got the red around the eye, which is really quite vivid, um, which I think would look look good in there. I do like I do like blue in my fish. Is there any chance of any blue? So they had some really nice tetras at the place we're going to today, which is the blueberry tetra, Hyphus broken wadai which was described by my old professor's friend, actually. Wow. And they have this lovely purple, bluish sheen through them. Uh, they've got some there that are colouring up, so you might take a look at them. They're not too deep, but not too long, so they might be the right kind of shape. Mm. Um, blue Emperor Tetras. Oh, yeah, I love that. I've never kept those before, either. They're stunning. They're, they're not tight shoulders. They kind of, sort of hang around in loose groups. Interesting. For the viewers that are watching, why should we actually listen to you when you're talking about fish? Good question. Um, because if you want your aquascape, your aquarium, your biotope to look good long term, and your fish to be healthy long term, you need to think carefully before you add the fish. Is this animal going to thrive in this environment? Is it going to thrive in this environment for the entire length of its life? As in, is it going to grow too big? Is it going to suffer? Is it going to cause strife with the other inhabitants? And also, in terms of simply cosmetic, is it going to combine nicely? Mm -hmm with my planting or with my layout or, you know, 
a very long, slim tank with high-bodied, some squat fish, it doesn't flow. Whereas a long, slim tank with long, slim fish as they move back and forth, flows much more naturally. And every time you look at your tank, which you do on a daily basis, mm. it's more aesthetically pleasing to the eye. So you will love your creation and you'll stay in love with it. That, do you know what? That is a really interesting point. I've never really given, given that much thought. But if you're not really happy with your aquarium and you're seeing that every day, source of continual unhappiness, that's, really, that's, that's going to be damaging for you, like for your wellness. So, and it, it makes absolute sense now, kind of, I'm living this because the more pristine and more well-maintained and healthy looking my aquariums are, the more beautiful and vibrant the fish are looking, the more healthy and algae free the plants are. I know that's a reflection of the amount of energy and effort I've put into that aquarium. And so it rewards me and I feel rewarded and, and well because of that. If I've neglected the aquarium because of either laziness, ill health, um, low mood, that lack of effort is then reflected in the aquarium and you could potentially get more algae, the, you might not be feeding the fish so frequently so they'll not be so vibrant and, and therefore the, the aquarium there almost becomes a mirror to you. Mm -hmm. And I know I'm digressing from the original topic of choosing fish. But I think this is a really important topic that maybe viewers are watching right now that maybe aren't uh, completely aware of, that the, your aquarium is potentially a mirror of your own kind of state. But it isn't necessarily you controlling your state that changes your state, it's actually some action that can then change your state. So by focusing your action on your aquarium, maintaining it appropriately, choosing the right fish, uh, buying the right plants, uh, doing the research to make those things thrive, you put in the right energy and the right time and the right level of kindness into that thing that you're looking after. And that kindness is then, because it's self-care. It it's, self it's, it's empathy for the animals and the lives that are in your care, yeah. which is, becomes empathy for yourself. If they're thriving, you're thriving. Also, you make it easier for yourself if you choose the right fish from the get-go because the stress and perhaps the maintenance, and you choose some fish that's going to completely destroy your aquascape every day and dig up your plants, that's not going to help. It's going to help. stress you out. It's going to stress you out. It's going to cause extra maintenance. If you've got fish that are particularly, you know, vulnerable or fragile or they're getting bullied by a fish, you know, try and keep the fish you really want to keep, but make sure you've got your research in place, make sure the display is catered for them. Often with planted displays, I see this all the time in like the the competition, aquascaping competitions. Mm. The fish are clearly an afterthought. afterthought. Yes. And they shouldn't be. They are the stars of your show. The aquascape is your stage. You know, imagine if we put all all our attention on the props and the, and the backdrop, and then we put, you know, actors who are completely useless. Yeah. It wouldn't be much of a show. No. Everything has to be in harmony. You know, the stage has to be right. The props have to be right. The storyline has to be great. The storyline is told by how your fish engage and look and act in their environment with your backdrop. Yeah, the storyline isn't just the the aesthetic of the isn't that aquascape, final photo, which is where I've been going wrong. You know, like up to recently, you know, before we started hanging out more and working on the book, I was just operating on surface level with aquascaping. I was just seeing it as an aesthetically beautiful thing, mm. and the fish are there to enhance the aesthetic, and that's really quite you know um, base level really. But now you know, as I'm working with the fish more, working with you more, you know, work just working more in generally with, with nature and feeling more connected with the nature, you know, I understand that level of responsibility is far beyond just uh, the consumer desire to satisfy our kind of aesthetic sensibility. I think that's really selfish in fact. I think you're right and I think understanding that and being able to act on it is quite rewarding to oneself. Um, when you asked earlier about like why should we listen to you about fish as well, mm. it's not just because I sort of have a some innate knowledge or, or notion of what fish. It's because I've spent hundreds and hundreds of hours underwater observing freshwater fish in habitats, often in planted habitats, mm. and observing how they live and thrive, or you know how they how they engage with that space, how they engage relative to the other fishes around them, what parts of the habitat they're using, including what time of day are they using what part. How are they foraging? How are, where do they go to hide? Where are they most confident? And then I can think of escape in a tank, in the confines of a tank, and think, well, how do we replicate that? 
to cater to the needs of the animals that we want to put in. Well, that depends on what animals we're putting in. Right, so now we need to think carefully. These are the fish we're gonna add because I've already set up my scape and they will do well, or I'm gonna set up my scape to cater to these fish. But they should always be the focus because they are our, they're the main characters in our stories that we want to tell. And we have a responsibility just to be kind to other life forms, I think. Yeah, as a